I'm live on the other one now, so I'm going to end this one. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to give everybody a little bit of an opportunity to um, just reconnect with this live broadcast because um, this is uh, me uh, massively messing up the live broadcast for today. But basically, I'm here to talk to everybody about not being afraid of a DNF. And a DNF, for anybody who doesn't know, is a did not finish. Brilliant, I can see loads of people who are talking on the live chat, so that's brilliant. Six people um, have definitely uh, got to me there, that's fantastic. Okay, so that's great. I'm just gonna move the comments over to this side so I can, I can wait here. Okay, oh, fantastic. So loads of people have been waiting. That is absolutely brilliant. So now I'm back in the room, fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna start as, we're gonna start with the talk that I did at the National Running Show this Saturday. So um, basically I did a talk on not being afraid of a DNF which is a did not finish for anybody who's not familiar with that terminology. So um, I did a race called the Cape Wrath Ultra and it was in May um, and I'm just going to put there. That is a DNF and it is, it's horrible isn't it? It's a a really really horrible word and hopefully by the end of this talk we are going to have redefined the redefined the word DNF so for anybody who's just joining it's the Cape Wrath Ultra and it's the DNF that I'm talking about. So this is Don't Be Afraid of a DNF, Cape Breath Ultra. Okay, so fantastic. There's loads of people um, who are joining now. That's fantastic. That's great. And so I'll just give this little talk and then I will take your questions at the end. So DNF stands for D, did not finish, but we are gonna have redefined that by the end of this talk. So next slide is, here we go. Next slide. So this is the Cape Breath Trail. So it's um, an eight day race and it's, 100, uh, it's 250 miles, which is about 400 kilometers for anybody who's in pay. And it's got 11,200 meters of ascent. So that's almost twice Everest. So it's a really long way. It's averaged 30 miles a day and it's pathless terrain. I just thought, um, oh, I'll come to that in a minute, why I decided to even do this race. So the next slide is why, why on earth would anybody decide to do a race like this? It's, it's a really hard race. It's really quite remote and you definitely need a special set of skills to um, complete it successfully. So, um, I decided that I wanted to do this race because the scenery looked amazing. It just looks so beautiful um, out there in the middle of Scotland. You've got um, all these amazing mountains, there's pathless terrain. And I just was, I really liked the idea of just putting one foot in front of the other and, and that that was the only thing that you had to worry about that day, just putting one foot in front of the other. It sounded to me like it was going to be brilliant. Um, hopefully I'd be going in the right direction um, because I got myself a good GPS watch. So then that, yeah, that's that one there. So hopefully going in the right direction. So then I just thought, wow, what a great way to explore Scotland and I thought it's fantastic that you've got the safety of this race. So um, the race is organised by Aurea Events. They do the Dragon's Back race and they do um, the Rab Mountain Marathon, the GL3D um, and the Skyline Scotland. So they do a ton of races and the race organiser, Shane Oley, um, is an old friend of mine. So um, I just thought, fantastic. That is great. The marshals are lovely. Look at the lovely marshals there. They, they had the right idea, didn't they? And um, also the opportunity to run with like-minded people. So this is a friend, Julie. Um, I met her on day uh, two, I think it was three maybe, and uh, we hung out together and uh, got each other through some tough times. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so like-minded people there um, spot the uh, semi-naked guy in the back there. <laughs> he is the most awesome marshal ever. Um, He's called Kaz the Hat, and he also organises a race in the Priscelli Hills called the Priscelli Beast. So definitely check that out if you're ever in Wales. So then we... 
um, basically the race was fully catered as well. And uh, so there's a shot of some marshals eating their dinner by the portaloos, lovely. And I just thought, wow, people take a drop bag for you, then they put the tent, your tent up at the end of the night. And like, I just thought, wow, isn't that amazing? It sounds like luxury to me. Little did I know. So there was only one problem with all of this amazing views and um, a luxury drop bag tent putting up business and that was the running, <laughs> strangely. So um, I was very surprised by this as you can imagine being a runner. So I had done a lot of training. So I had, if you look at my Strava, I'm, um, my name's Claire Maxted and um, you can find me quite easily, I think, on Strava. You can have a look at my stats for um, the early last year and see how I was training. I was basically, I was putting in um, quite a few 40, 45, 50 mile weeks um, and then a few 60 to 70 mile weeks. And I even did a five day consecutive 20 mile um, back to back um, uh, five consecutive days um, and I did that whilst I was on a running club holiday in Norfolk which probably isn't it's not the best place for hills but I did a fair few hill reps within that so I tried my best <laughs> basically and I thought I was doing pretty well with the old training thing um, so day one went quite well um, it was only 23 miles on day one with only 500 meters of climb so that was that was a good day it was a little bit uh, rainy and drizzly but there's that is actually uh, the lady on the right hand side there that's actually a lady called Mrs Wade and she was my school teacher <laughs> so she surprised me by being there and that's her husband next to her as well so they were um, they were on the race too and that was a total surprise to me and that was really fun um, then that's uh, just a bit more views of the race and then this is a lady called Amiko from Japan there was people from all over doing this race and um, she had the race logos um, on her uh, fingernails there so um, I just thought that was really fun uh, that she did that because I also had Kate Rath written on my nails <laughs> so then um, day two was um, that was good because it rained and I love the rain and uh, it was 35 miles with 1,800 meters of ascent so 35 miles what's that probably like for 60k maybe for those of you who are in metric so um, then uh, that day went well. So it was, this is what Scotland looks like everyone. It's, it's remote, there are rivers running through, it's wild mountainside, it's really green, it's also very boggy. And it has, because of the rain, the waterfalls were really, really impressive. And the river crossings were really impressive too. So there's me with a, a pair of poles, not unlike the pair of poles that somebody is gonna win later this evening. And then it just carried on and on. <laughs> Through all this pathless mountainside, we were running and well, probably walking by the stage. And I was loving it. That is the face of somebody loving the Cape Wrath Ultra. So I was having a great time on day two. Um, however, because of all this rain, I had some blisters and uh, they were starting to get really bad because uh, by now I'd run and walked about 50 miles and if you start running and walking 50 miles on blisters then it's something's going to go bad somewhere along the lines. So uh, this slide is also in here to warn me that if to tell you that if anyone is squeamish then you should definitely look away now. So um, there we go, blisters. So they don't look too bad, it's mainly the water here. But um, if you can see on the uh, on the right foot there, there's a, um, a, the little toe is surrounded in blister plasters and that because both of my little toes got these huge blisters on um, that, that were really, really, really painful. And um, this became my problem for the next couple of days. So let's have a look at what happened next. So day three is 42 miles with 2,400 meters of climbing. So that is an epic day. I mean, that is an epic day if you're not doing a multi-day race. That 42 miles, what's that? About 75 kilometers, something like that, with 2,400 meters of climb. So that's like climbing Ben Nevis twice from sea level there. And so this was had the most amazing views. It was absolutely incredible. It was just such an amazing place to be and it was just absolutely amazing look at all these mountains here 
and there's more here. This is my friend Julie again, and then there is this is it's just to show you how pathless it was just these vast tracts of just empty mountainside um and they were just going on for miles and miles and miles so that um is the last slide that i can actually find just here let me just make sure i can get some more in okay right hold on a second so this day is day three and I'm thinking oh goodness me I've already got blisters and I'm I'm now running and walking 42 miles so the day took us from half seven in the morning until half seven until quarter to eleven at night so this is us at the end of day three um look at us um that is not a smile of joy on my face i'm absolutely knackered by this time and um my friend julie she's all right she's done loads of these type of things before so um i had a quick inspection of the old feet and honestly if i could have amputated that little toe then i would have done um my feet were starting to look like some kind of a zombie feet and it was it came as a real surprise to me because I'd trained so hard for this um, but I was in a, such a lot of pain from these really annoying tiny tiny blisters it was just so annoying that they were so tiny I mean they didn't look anything but every footstep basically felt like I was walking on knives with somebody stabbing a hot poker into the side of my foot so it was just really really horrible it, it was kind of like torture actually um, and um, so this was the first time that I thought, oh my goodness, maybe, maybe I need to quit. Like, should I quit? But it was, it's the evening, okay? So it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm trying to get ready in my tent. I've got a 5 a.m. start in the morning. I've, I've run nearly, like, probably 90 miles by now, nearly 100 miles within three days with loads of mountains, loads of off path, and I've got these horrendous blisters. And I was thinking to myself, no, don't quit now because you never should quit. This is one piece of advice I definitely give for sure. You should never quit on the evening of a multi-day race. You should always sleep on it, wait till the morning and have another go because you just probably need some sleep. So I did that. I had some sleep and uh, basically woke up the next morning, 5am, looking like that. <laughs> now, is that, this is what I said at the National Running Show, is this the face of somebody who wants to get up and run 22 miles with 1,400 metres of climb? And it is not, but I'm no quitter. So I got up, I got dressed, um, I assessed my feet, warning, more blister pictures coming up now. So that's the next picture. So the, the feet had just ballooned overnight and obviously you take all those plasters off and you give them a good wash and everything. And um, you can see here this, this little toe is becoming really quite red and that's basically because it's becoming infected. Um, so it really was very disgusting and and it hurt like crazy as well, more to the point. It hurt like crazy. So I manned up. I got going, I shoved my sh feet into my now feeling very tiny shoes because my feet were swelling not only with the heat but with all these blisters sort of splitting the foot apart like that um, and my feet felt my feet felt really huge in these tiny tiny shoes and um, they were just my normal size of shoes but I'd just swollen up so much um, and the most galling thing about this day was the views were incredible so look at this we've got these absolutely stunning mountainside through Torridon uh, isn't that a beautiful picture and then we've got um, we uh, crossed several rivers and it was really nice to put your feet in these rivers um, because it reduced the swelling and it made everything cold and um, it made everything a bit more lubricated with the water as well every time the feet dried out it was really really painful again um, so basically I did this day um, <laughs> feeling terrible even though the views are absolutely incredible which was it was just awful <laughs> but look look at that like that was amazing there was no path um, but we had to do uh, loads of stuff like that with no path and it's either really heathery or really rocky like this and that is absolutely incredible however 
I was just becoming a real dirge to be around, to be quite honest. So Julie had left me at this point because I was like, go on, Julie, save yourself. Because I was just becoming a really uh, horrible person to be around. I wasn't a great companion. All I was doing was moaning to anybody I met about how painful my feet were. And all I could think about was put every time I put my foot down, that knife was driving into me again. And the uh, it felt like a bee was stinging um, inside of the blister. It felt like the blister had sort of popped itself open and it was stinging me. And so I was just in this incredible plane. And I just thought to myself, Claire, you're in this beautiful, beautiful place and you're miserable. And I just just suddenly thought, this is not how I want to see the mountains. I'd thought that for me, the Cape Bath Ultra would be um, straightforward enough that I, it would be a challenge, but that I could um, but that I could enjoy it. But actually, I didn't have the fitness required and I didn't have the, the footwear and the, the foot care um, required to complete, complete the race feeling all right. Um, and I just got to the point where I thought, do you know what? This isn't how I want to see the world. Um, so at the top of this hill here that I'm showing you now, I decided to quit. I know. The only thing that would have made me continue was if somebody's life had depended on me um, walking a step further. And that's how bad the feet were. I, it's really difficult to convey like now because you can't imagine being in that kind of pain now. And you're just probably thinking, oh, she should have just manned up and got on with it. But but I just I just could, I just didn't want to. I, I could have. If it had been a five day race, I would have, I would have through sheer bloody mindedness, I would have continued and I would have bandaged the feet up and I would have just sucked it up for one more day. But just the sheer fact that there was four more days of this ahead just made me think, no, this is not how I want to see the world. I want to see the world um, without pain, basically. So, um, so I got back and I met up with my old teacher who, um, she'd also um, dropped out of the race. Uh, she wasn't competitive anymore because she, um, she had uh, not got in on a cut off uh, to cut off time. That was the other thing about the race. Um, you couldn't just walk it; you had to run. So it did make it quite stressful because you had to get in before all these cut off times. So it wasn't just a lovely walk in the mountains. It was a oh god, I need to be at this cut off by this time, and and that just it just wasn't working for me. That way of being in the mountains, I wasn't at the fitness level where I could just breeze along and it'd be fine. Um, so then. Um, so what what did I do once I quit? Well, I decided to stay with the race and cheer everybody else on. So, I did uh, I did some laying about. That's not actually me, but I did some lying about. I hung out with the marshals, and they had a really that they had it all sorted. They would um, set up the tents and then go for a ten k run. I should be a marshal next time, and I supported everybody else. So this is. Um, some of the other runners setting off for day five. I did a lot of supporting of other people. So this is Julie setting off for day seven. Julie um, completed the race and it was amazing because kind of through her, I sort of saw the race. And meanwhile, we are all, all us non-competitive people are um, in a car just seeing the mountains by car. So this is the support vehicle which drove us from place to place. So for the, the next three days, I let my feet heal and breathe and I got in this van and oh, we had a lovely time. Look at the mountains that we saw. We saw some lovely mountains and look at that. This is beautiful, like go to Scotland, definitely. This is absolutely beautiful. Um, and oh yes, yes, we had a few cups of tea in cafes and oh, it was a lovely way to recover. Um, supporting Julie again. The race was really hot. It, I don't know if anyone else, um, oh of course, uh, anyone in Britain will know that we had an unprecedentedly hot summer this last year. So um, everyone was, Julie's actually being sprayed by water there on the, uh, on the, the on that, that side, that side. And then, um, People are coming in in like various states of zombification here. So we've got people bandaged up. We've got people with hiking poles. We've got people's knees falling off. People with hair that hasn't been washed for days. And um, uh, yeah, so people are coming through and they are looking um, increasingly, increasingly tired. And 
finally I decided to get back in the race and do day eight. So I actually, to do this, I had to borrow a temp mate's pair of shoes. So I put these on my feet. So she had a pair of shoes which was two sizes bigger than mine. I'm a size six, hers were a size eight. And I got these on there, the Innovate Park Claws. I'm wearing the Innovate Trail Talons there. And the galling thing was, I had run 100 miles in five days in the shoes on the left, which are the X Talons, the Cross Talons, 290s. And I was fine. So. All of a sudden I was in Scotland and I was running 100 miles and they were too small and it's because it was really warm in Scotland and I'd been doing the bulk of my training in March and can you remember last March it was snowing and it was actually really really cold so my feet had obviously swollen up from the heat in Scotland and then they'd got these blisters which had made them split like that as well so I was kind of doubly uh, my feet had doubly grown, um, so they weren't fitting into these shoes, so definitely pack a pair of extra big shoes if you're going to do any kind of ultra running. So I'm just going to delete some of these screenshots now. Okay, so now we've got day eight. So this is me and Julie setting off on day eight. Woohoo! Yeah, we're doing day eight. And day eight was amazing. So this is, this was another thing. I really wanted to see this beach here, which is called Sandwood Bay. It's really remote. You can't get to it by car. There are no roads to it. The only way you can get in is by hiking a couple of miles from the nearest small village. So this is me and Julie hiking towards it. And then there's just this mile upon mile of this beautiful golden sand. People were camping there. People were waking up out of their tents and going, what the hell is happening because all these runners and like like zombies were just walking or like spluttering past um with like various we must have smelled horrible um and then this is one of my this is my favorite photo actually of the entire race and that's Julie um coming up from that beach Sandwood Bay um with that beautiful blue sea in the background and all these cliffs and the, the little needle there in the distance and it was just absolutely incredible. And I was really glad that I stepped back into the race to do day eight because this is what I was there for. This is this is why I wanted to do the race, to see these amazing places. And, and finally, I was getting to do that. And I, I was really pleased because I wasn't in as much pain doing this. It still was painful, but, you know, it was the last day and I was I was all right by then. Okay, so then we were just going across this real pathless terrain and we were um, going up and down, these rivers were crossing the valleys um, and we were just going up and down, up and down and then really randomly we saw a man with a donkey. I don't know what he was doing, he was a bit too far away to ask him. Um, and then up and down, up and down, and finally, 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 we saw the lighthouse came into view at Cape Wrath, and this was another thing that I really, really wanted to see. I wanted to see the lighthouse at Cape Wrath. So um, me and Julie finally got there, we had our picture taken together by the lighthouse, and um, she was really thrilled because she's she'd obviously done all eight days, and I was really thrilled for her because I was cheering her on at every point, and, and just just making sure that she was all right and helping her out like getting food for her and stuff and walking about for her and things like that so it kind of felt like um it kind of felt like I'd finished too even though I'd missed out three days <laughs> but um never mind <laughs> and then everyone was really tired so they all slept on the bus um there's a one road out from uh, Cape Wrath the lighthouse and um from that road wow I didn't go to sleep at all because there was these absolutely stupendous views still if you ever get the chance to go to Cape Wrath then definitely 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 put it on your to-do list because it's absolutely beautiful there. Um, and this is uh, just a view of the loch, just, and a, just a reminder about my shoes there. And then there was this massive award ceremony and um, there's Julie going up to get her awards. There's tons of people here. We're all in this big room having beers and comparing feet and things like that, just comparing everyone's blisters. Can you see Julie's foot there? Julie's got a white skirt on and she's on the left hand side. Can you see any any glimpse of a blister there? I don't think you can. So yes, I think if you get blisters, it's really, really, really hard. Um, and uh, yeah, that's my excuse. And <laughs> and so then I'm gonna come on to the lessons that I learned now. And this is just a picture of me at the campsite, just enjoying the view and, and just sort of having a bit of a think and coming to terms with the fact that, no, I didn't get a medal. I, I did feel a bit left out, you know, at the ceremony and everything, because I just, I didn't get a medal and, and everyone else was going up and getting medals. 62% of the people who entered the race finished it and um, and I was one of the 38% who couldn't finish. So I did feel a bit glum, 
but I have five things that I learned from this race that I wanna share with you in case you also have a DNF or, or just stuff doesn't go to plan in your races because it won't always. Like I've done tons of races where I've completed them and, and you know been really like determined to finish and, and um, just put everything into it. But for this one is a, a rare one where I just decided I needed to quit. So number one is step up more gradually. So this was an eight day race and I had done several three day races. So I did the Druids challenge a couple of times and I did the Costa Rica coastal challenge where I missed out one day because I was ill. So that was a five day. -er. Um, and I'd done also the Iceberg, which is an absolutely amazing race in Sweden. Definitely do that one if you can. Um, but um, so I was really familiar with three day races and I was really quite good at three day races, but I don't know what made me think I could just step up to an eight day race first of all without doing more sort of back to back training. I did do five days back to back but I think if you did a few more five days, if you can find any five days anywhere then that would have been a really good idea. So I, I think I should have stepped up a little bit more gradually there. And then number two, beating blisters does actually take some experience. So there's nothing like doing an eight day race to make you realize that you get blisters in places that you've never really thought of before because you haven't run that far before. So that was another thing to think about too. Um, and it's just, it is unfortunate, but it's sort of like getting an injury, getting blisters. Um, I did have an injury going into the race. So I had plantar fasciitis, but I went to see Paul Hobra at physio and therapy before I went up. And um, cause he's in Corbridge near Newcastle. And he actually did some shockwave therapy on my foot. And um, and it was actually fine for the four days, which was really, really weird. Um, it was the blisters that hurt. Not, it wasn't the plantar fasciitis that made me um, made me DNF this race. It was definitely the blisters that made me, um, made me reconsider that. So, um, it does take a bit of experience and um yeah what once you've once you've DNF'd one race because of blisters then you can you've got something to work on there. You've you can cover up hot spots before they start to take root. You can get a pair of bigger shoes. I think that was the main thing for me that I should have got a pair of two sizes, two big shoes, which I didn't have. Um and it just takes experience to know what you personally need. Um, so then the third thing that I wanted to just talk about was just to be honest with yourself. I mean, um, if I if I had been really wanting to complete that race more than anything else in my entire life, then yeah, I might have I might have put up with the pain for every step. But I've got to the stage of my life now, I'm in my mid thirties and I've done pain. I've been an endurance hiker since I was 12 years old. I've done black toenails, I've done aching limbs, I've done fatigue so much that you fall over when you're walking. I've done, um, I've, I've just done red hot pokers sticking into your thighs after the Bob Graham round. I've done a lot of pain and I've done a lot of endurance races. And I just thought, do you know what? That's not how I wanna see the world anymore. I want a challenge, don't get me wrong, but I don't want it to, I don't wanna be miserable, basically. Life is too short. I'm not a refugee coming over from a war-torn country that has to put up with such misery. I'm, um, I'm really fortunate. I'm, I live in a brilliant place. And why am I putting myself through this pain? Like to me, it was it was kind of like a tantamount to self harm. If I had continued, it was like self punishment, and I don't really I don't really want to do that anymore. <laughs> so so that was me. That was me just being honest with myself about how I wanted to see the world and what I wanted my trail running to be. So I would just um, definitely advise that you be honest with yourself too. And then number four, um, actually, I was thinking because I was in the um, in this race and everyone was going up to get their medals and everyone um, it looked it felt like everyone had finished the race because a lot of the people who did drop out actually just got the train home, so they weren't a lot of us around. So you felt like a failure, but actually. It was a real achievement for me because I'd run further in those four days than I'd ever run in four days in my entire life before. So I'd run about 125 miles within the four days, and or maybe it was 140. I can't, I can't quite remember. I can't do maths that quickly in my head. But I'd run further and with more ascent and over more difficult terrain than I ever had in my life. So actually, for me, that was quite a big achievement. And I just shouldn't have gone for a full eight-day race. <laughs> I should have just 
set my bar a bit lower. I think I just bit off a bit too much that I could chew. So actually I had a big achievement there, but it kind of comes out as a failure because I quit. So, but you have to remember where you are at and maybe you slightly overreached yourself. <laughs> so I definitely did that. And then the final one is number five, don't compare yourself to others. So I actually went up to uh, Jim Mann. Um, I don't know if you've ever followed him on social media. He's um, really big in the ultra running multi-day community. He's a good orienteer as well. Um, he doesn't like the media, so you won't see a lot of him. Um, I do have one interview with him on my channel. Um, um, and I'll maybe link up to it um, afterwards. But he he had a couple of blisters, and he was the second male. And I went up to him, and I was like, Jim, would you? I showed him my feet, and I was like, Would you run on these blisters? And he was like, Yeah, I'd just man up and don't be a wimp. And I was like, Ah. Oh. And then I just suddenly thought, he takes half the time as me to get round that course. And so he is on his feet for half the time, and then he gets twice the time to recover and sleep and do everything he needs to do to get ready for the next day. And I'm out there for 15 hours, pretty much, whereas he's out for more like seven or maybe even six hours. So for him to run on a, a few small, he did show me his feet in the blisters, there was couple of really tiny ones, but not nothing like mine. For him to run uh, with my feet for 15 hours, I think even he might have a, a little bit of a shock there. So I just decided, just you just can't compare yourself to anybody else. And and also, I mean, he, um, he DNF'd in the OM, the original mountain marathon, in the 50th anniversary year, the other year, because he didn't pack enough warm clothing and it got really, really cold and they were on the verge of getting hypothermia. So they DNF'd him and his partner. So, even the elites DNF is what I'm saying and you can't ever compare yourself to others nobody else knows the pain that you're going through or the pain that you're willing to put up with um, in order to do the things that you do so it's pointless trying to compare yourself to others and if you're happy with your decision and you're happy with the DNF then um, you don't have to explain yourself to anybody so um, so I said at the beginning of this talk that we would hopefully redefine DNF and I think that rather than did not finish, I think DNF should actually, actually say did not fail. Because I don't think I failed on the Cape Wrath Ultra. Okay, so I didn't complete the race. Yeah, that, you can define that as a failure. But I ran further than I've ever run in my life before. I saw some incredible mountainsides, and then on eight, day eight, I got back in the game. I got a, a huge, huge shoe to put on, and I reached, I saw the, um, I saw Sandwood Bay, and I saw Cape Wrath, and all the things that I'd wanted to see. So it wasn't a failure for me. Um, it was a definite did not fail. So that is how I would like us to redefine DNF. It's not a did not finish, it's a did not fail. And there's tons you can learn from it. So hopefully that story has um, just given you a little bit of an insight into um, into the Cape Bath Ultra first of all, like it's absolutely amazing. And if you're super, super fit and you've got, you know, a good handle on your feet, then definitely it's an amazing race to go for. It's absolutely brilliant. The the organization is absolutely amazing. It's lovely food, the tents are all put up for you and the mountains are just absolutely beautiful. It's an amazing way to see Scotland. But if you're not quite fit enough like I was and you um, struggle with your feet, then you're gonna definitely find it tough. So maybe build up um, uh, to some smaller one, do some smaller ones first. Um, the race also is actually really good in that if you um, if you can't complete each day, then you get the option to sort of jump in halfway sometimes, or they pick you up at halfway sometimes. It's always at the race organizer's discretion because it's not actually a, a part race. They, they want you to do the whole thing really, um, but that is another option. And there was one lady who signed up for the race knowing that she wouldn't be able to compete it and knowing that she would just do as much as she could on each day. So that's also another thing to think about. Okay, so I am going to read some of your questions now because um, I'm sure you've got loads of questions um, about the race. I'm just going to scroll back through the comments um, and I'm going to have a drink of water because I've been talking quite a lot and I'm going to take this off now um, so that I can see you fully. Oh, oh, there's another picture up there. Where's that come from? Oh, where's that? Okay, I'm back. So, uh, right, 
Cape Wrath Ultra. Okay, so la 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 la. Oh yeah, yeah. Questions, questions, questions. Lots of people saying hi. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties earlier as well. That was really, really hard. Um, that is great. Um, apparently I was on both live streams for a moment. That's, that's interesting. Um, Melanie Dolby says, have I tried the women's Salomon trail vest? Good luck today. All working now. Um, the women's trail, Salomon trail vest. I am getting that in. Um, I'm getting that in, um, at the end of February. Apparently it's out in March, so they don't want to give it me till February. So I'm going to have a bit of a sneak preview anyway. Um, so Simon of Wales says he missed my talk at the running show, so hopefully that's caught up with you now, um, Simon. Um, uh, yeah, the running show was really cool, and I'll take you through some of the things that I got there just in, in a moment as well. I've got some, like, little goodies to show you. Um, Guy Greatrex, hi to you as well. Um, people saying still smiling on day two. Um, great... Um, yes, Guy Greatrex says, when you get a blister like that, you need to pop them. Yes, I did pop the blisters, um, and then grit sort of got into where I had popped them. You, you basically make everything sterile, and then you sort of lance them with, like, a sharp pin, and then you, um, tape, the, you, you, um, disinfect them, and you tape them up. Um, you, people were using that kinesiology tape, the K-tape, so we were putting that all around our toes, um, um, so that was basically the treatment for the blisters. But the, the problem was then the, the foot was already swollen. And then with the tape, it made them swell even more. So then it just didn't fit into my shoe. And I think that was the main problem. That's why I got the blisters in the first place, because the shoe was too small. And it wasn't the fault of the shoe. The shoe was great. It was just that my feet were swelling up more than I thought. Um, Okay, so Kurt Steed is saying he can't imagine a grumpy Claire. Oh, a grumpy Claire definitely exists. <laughs> that guy on a bike says, we've all been there. Big respect for making that decision. Oh, bless. Thank you. And um, Itoji Kawasaki says, um, sometimes quitting is the right move to make and it does take a great deal of courage to settle with it. Yeah, I think so. Because I think if you DNF something like I did, I mean, it just gives people the opportunity to judge, doesn't it? Like, I'm sure, like... Um, even people on here, like friend, uh, us as friends, are, are sort of judging each other and and just thinking, oh well, you know, she probably, you know, didn't didn't prepare well enough, and she was a bit namby pamby, and it's just like, well, yeah, maybe I was, maybe I am a bit too namby pamby for races like that. Maybe I'm not hardcore enough for races like that. I'm sure that if somebody's life depended on it, like if my sister or or parents' lives depended on that race, I would have continued, but. I just didn't see the need to um, because I was in, in a lot of pain and I just want to be happy in my life. So yeah, I, I think, yeah, in the old Claire would have probably tried to continue and just would, um, the, the thoughts of everybody else would have bypassed the pain that I was feeling. But but older Claire knows that I'm the, I'm the only person that I need to prove anything to. So it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Okay, so... Um, Paul Way says, blimey, what did I just join? Oh, did you just come in at blisters? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Steve Horton said he loved listening to this at the running show. Um, Merlin Keating says, can you do a show on GPS watches soon? I could do, but I only, I know, only know really about two GPS watches, but I can do a show on my, on what, on mine. Um, I will make a note of that and put it on the list. Um, John Simpson says, Scotland is notorious for midges. What was it like on this race? Oh yes, that's a good point. So the midges were fine when you were running. Um, there weren't really any any midges that um, then I couldn't really um, couldn't really see any midges when I was running but th when the midges came that was um, that was uh, at the campsite so as you got further north um, and uh, less people around um, the midges um, were quite uh, voracious there um, so if you couldn't really stop anywhere so if you needed to go to get some food you had to put a midge net on um, and try and eat it under that um, if you walked around they couldn't find you um, but it was mostly around sunset that the midges were and then so before sunset and after sunset they kind of died off a bit but the thing that was really quite bad um, further north actually was the ticks so we stayed in this one campsite I 
I can't remember what day it was, but it was quite really far north. I think it was probably day seven. And um, there was loads of ticks and there was loads of the baby ticks as well. Um, and what they do is they burrow into your skin and then they suck your blood and then they drop off. But if you find one, you've got to use a ticker picker to sort of twist them out. Um, you can't just um, you can't just pull them out because then they leave their head in and um, and then they leave all sorts of nasties in, in your skin. Um, and ticks are really bad for for this disease called Lyme's disease, which can really mess up your immune system and just give you all sorts of problems. It's really hard to detect it as well. So, um, so yeah, uh, the ticks were actually worse than the midges, I'd say, because midges just give you a bit of a bite, but ticks could actually give you some long lasting problems. So um, yeah, I'd say uh, midges uh, or eight out of 10, uh, ticks 10 out of 10 <laughs> on when you got further north anyway. Um, I didn't get any by the way. Um, Jim Cooper said, says DNF did nothing fatal. You live to run another day. Exactly. I love that as well. Yeah, that's another reason for DNFing. The weather might change. Um, your circumstances might change. Anything can happen. So I think, um, yeah, you just got to use your own judgment as to whether you DNF or not. Okay, so Rosen213 wants to know how many miles on average a day. So the Cape Wrath Ultra is average 30 miles a day, but it's the, the first day is 23 miles and the last day is 16 miles. So the rest of the days are all plus 30 miles plus usually. So there's, so there's a mixture of like 35 miles, 42 miles, 22 miles. 35 miles, 40 miles. There was two 40 mile days, but it's not just the mileage, it's the ascent as well. So um, I think one of the biggest ascent days had about 3000 meters of climbing. And bear in mind, that's not on paths. It's on this really rough, rocky, heathery, um, just heathery pathless terrain that really takes a lot of energy just to, to get across it. And you can sometimes go about two miles an hour. Honestly, it's so slow. Um, so John Gardner there likes the word zombification. Yeah, made that up, made that up myself. Um, and uh, yep. Oh, oh, apparently somebody else has met a person with a donkey as well. Um, Demon Runner has uh, said the first time he ran in the Ardennes, uh, they met a lady with a donkey. She was traveling um, on a small multi-day hike with the donkey. So that's probably why I should have done. I should have got on the donkey. Okay. And yeah, so any more questions here? Um, oh, a nice one here from Steve Horton. Whilst in the forces, I was told to soak my feet in white spirit before an event to harden the skin and prevent blisters. Yeah, that's another thing that you could try as well. Um, that's fantastic. Oh, okay, so yes, this is a great question from Rob Downer here. Would you do the Cape Breath Ultra again? And what would you do differently? Okay, so my answer to that is the race, no. I wouldn't do the race again because I know what I'd need to do differently and that is a lot more training. So I'd have to be probably 50% fitter to be able to come in um, really easily before those cutoff times and have a nice time of it. I'd also have to spend a lot of time looking at my shoes and get my blisters really sorted and um, and I've just found that if I do a three day race, I don't have to spend as much time training. I don't have to really sort out my blister issue because you can cope with anything for three days. And, um, and I didn't, I've never actually got as bad blisters as that before in my life ever. It came as a complete shock to me. So, so to answer your question, no, I would not do the race again. Um, I would encourage anybody else to go for the race because it's absolutely fantastic. And if you've got the fitness level, then that's amazing. It's an amazing challenge, but I wouldn't do it. What I would do though, after putting that presentation together and looking at all those photos again, I'd love to just go back to the, the, the three days that I didn't do. And I would love to do them just in one day. So just go out for like say a half marathon distance and just do a couple of hours, maybe four hours, running in those mountains, just feeling good, um, stopping for a picnic, taking photographs, maybe making a film of it, and then coming home to a nice hot bath and doing things the luxury way. So that's what I'd want to do. It's not that I don't want to see these places again, but I just think the, the format of a race where it's quite pressured for time and um, 
so you need to be really fit and you can't really stop. Um, I think that's just, it's not for me on that distance. My ideal distances are about sort of half marathon to marathon distance for probably three days, four maximum. So I think that's, I think that this race has shown me that that's my sweet spot and I think that's what I should kind of stick with. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, yeah. Uh, Kurt Steed says, look at all the DNFs at the UTMB this year. Yeah, exactly. Like, I should have just said I got stung by a bee, shouldn't I? It felt like I was being stung by a bee um, in my in my little toes. It did. Um, so, yeah, Killian Jornet, if, if you didn't know, he got stung by a bee and his foot swelled up so he couldn't continue on the UTMB. Um, uh, who else dropped out? Um, Jim Walmsley dropped, dropped out. Zach Miller dropped out as well. They were three um, vying for the podium. And they all dropped out. So, you see, DNFs happened to everybody. And nobody went to them and said, oh, you, you know you didn't train hard enough you you didn't you're a worse did they no one said that to them just stuff went wrong and they just couldn't complete the race fantastic um ah lots of um nice comments there thank you very much I'm glad that no one thinks I'm a total namby pamby I just when you put stuff out there like that it's there's loads of people I did say that at the running show there's loads of people going oh I did this and I did that and I succeeded at this and I ran I was just after a guy a lovely guy Brendan Rendell he'd he'd run 4,000 kilometers across Africa and he'd had similar issues to me he'd, he'd been struck down by vomiting and diarrhea and he had awful feet and he continued um, because he had this charity to raise money for and he was um, he just saw all the poverty around him and he thought I, I can't stop because I need to help these people by raising all this money whereas I wasn't doing mine for charity I was just doing mine to have a selfish fun uh, event and uh, it wasn't happening so I just I decided not to so it is a bit hard to sort of come out about these things okay um uh so yep oh Wayne Reed has also asked if I'm going to try the Cape Wrath again so I think I just answered that Tim Croft Claire who do you wish was at the show but was not oh that is a great question the national running show was really good there were some amazing speakers I got to meet Paula Radcliffe amazing Joe Pavey incredible Roger Black brilliant Ewan Thomas as well absolutely incredible um and there was loads of cool people like um Alex Kashefi as well there um and um Brendan Rendell as well and Vassos Alexander of course good pal of mine and yeah so and Anita Bean she was talking about nutrition Alex Cook was also talking about nutrition um and uh oh there was one more person as well but I forgot Nikki Love she was talking about running around Ireland and I think the lack of trail running people was really noticeable for me um and they they would love more trail runners to go to the national running show next year they would absolutely love it if people like you know like Damien Hall who came on last week um Nikki Spinks double Bob Graham record holder and um Jasmine Paris uh, the spine race overall record course record holder they'd love it if people like that went and I would too so actually I've got on my to-do list for um tomorrow I'm traveling somewhere tomorrow which I'll tell you about later um to email a load of um trail running brands and try to encourage them to um come to the the national running show next year um because they are going to have an ultra area they're going to have Dean Karnazes speaking um massively famous American ultra runner who I think is pretty cool because he orders pizzas halfway through an ultra run like that's the way to do it isn't it so um so Dean Carnassus is going to be there next year. So there's going to be a whole ultra area. There's going to be an obstacle race inside the NEC, which sounds absolutely amazing. So I think it would be brilliant for brands like Innovate and Salomon to come along and have a stand and get all their athletes there. Like I said to Mike, the organiser, wouldn't it be brilliant if you could get Killian Jornet and Emily Forsberg to come along? Like that's a big ask. Like they're, they're, cele they're proper celebrities, aren't they? They're like the king and queen and they'll have a baby by then. So I don't know if that's possible, but, but these things have all been mentioned. So that is that is a really good question uh john simpson said did i tape my feet before the blisters um well this is where i'm gonna have to come clean so uh on the first day i sort of felt it was as if like there was a grain of sand in 
in my little toe and my feet felt swollen from day one. It was really hot compared to when I was training. So right from the word go, my feet felt a bit squished and they felt a bit uncomfortable, but I couldn't really do anything about it because I didn't have a bigger pair of shoes. So from day one, I was getting the blister and I did tape it up, but of course, when you put tape on the blister, it makes it wider. So then I still had the same squishing of the foot problem. So yeah, I did tape it up as soon as I got it, which is like a brilliant thing to do. Um, but yeah, it just didn't uh, didn't help in this instance, sadly. Um, uh, la la la. More questions. Yeah, people saying too much pain is not worth it. Um, John Gardner would like to know how a person would really know if they're ready for the Cape Wrath Ultra. Um, and did I meet Ali Wren? Ooh, I, ooh, maybe. Was she a marshal? And is it a lady? If it was a lady and she was a marshal, is she short with curly hair? Then maybe. Um, but anyway, uh, how would you know if you're fit enough for the Cape Wrath Ultra? Well, I think even to arrive at the start line of that kind of race, having done um, like a six month block of low intensity, long distance training without an injury, if you could get to the start line without an injury, that would be an incredible achievement in itself. Um, that's how tough a race like that is. Um, but how do you know if you're fit enough? Well, I thought I was fit enough and I wasn't. Um, but I think you would know if you'd done some races before. So that comes back to that experience point that I was talking about, um, in learning point number one, um, which is just that you have to do a load more races. So do three day races, do four day races, do some five day races as well. And then once you have done a couple of those and been successful at those, then, um, it's just a stepping stone process. So you can feel like you're ready because you've done those other races. And I think that's what I didn't have. Okay. Um, fantastic. Sally Gilson said she DNF'd last Saturday after 9.5 miles of a 40 miler. She'd been suffering from a stomach bug, so couldn't retain any food. Well, I think that is wise. Like you just, you can't control everything in life. And if you've got a stomach bug, then I think it's very wise. And, and you're right, maybe you shouldn't have started, but you know, you've got to give these things a go. And like, it's like me on day four, I kind of knew that it wasn't going my way, but I just, you know, you have to start. And uh, that's brilliant, Sally. Well done. I hope you feel better now as well. Uh, oh, Simon of Wales, he's put a super chat up. I better answer this question. Um, big thanks for the shout out. Oh, he's just, he's just, yeah. All right, answer this question. So that's good. Thank you very much, Simon of Wales. Uh, that's very kind of you to super chat me two pounds. That's brilliant. Um, uh, lots of other people um, DNFing as well. Lots of DNF stories. Oh, I feel better now. I feel better now that everybody else is doing DNFs as well. John Gardner also wants to know, do the cutoffs vary every day or do you have to get in by 11 p.m. every night? Like what fraction of the time could you power walk versus run? This is also a really good question. So, um, the cutoffs, uh, the cutoffs did vary every day. So there were certain points that you, certain checkpoints that you had to be through by certain times. Otherwise you would get taken off the course. Um, but the course closed by 11 p.m. every day. So if you got through all the checkpoints that you needed to get through, there was kind of, there was usually two on the route which you had to get to by certain times. And they were really strict about that as well. Like even one second under and they'd be like, nope, sorry, you can't race anymore. And then if you get caught like that, then you can't race the next day as well. You have to have a rest day before you can jump back into the race. So, um, uh, what fraction of the time could you power walk versus run? So I would say that you had to, every time it was flat or downhill, you had to jog or, or well, running. You can't really run um, after about day three, I wouldn't have thought. So like, well, I can't anyway, the elites could. They were just bounding along. It was amazing seeing them coming past every day. Um, but yes, power walking up all the hills, like with your poles, like power walking up and then running, um, all the downhills for sure, and jogging on the flat bits as well. So that's how you'd get through it without the cutoffs. You couldn't just walk it all. It wasn't a walking race. You can walk the route in about two weeks. And I think um, that would be a really cool thing to do as well. Um, John Gardner also says, why do I also see Cape Wrath Ultra photos of people lying on their backs with their feet elevated on chairs? Did you bathe in streams every night? Oh, so they were putting their feet up on chairs because, um, to, uh, alleviate the swelling. So, um, if you, as you've spent all, t all day, like walking along, um, running along on your legs, your feet just swell 
they were swelling with the heat, they were swelling with the pressure and the time on your feet as well. So um, people were putting their legs up. Um, it's just the rest, ice and compression and elevate a theory that you get told rice, um, well we do in the UK. Um, and yeah, so it's rest, it's um, ice, it's compression and elevation. So people would put on compression um, calf guard things um, and socks. Um, they would dip their feet, there was usually some kind of river that you could, or lake, that loch, that you could uh, dip your feet in um, and have a bit of a wash in because there was no showers and then um, so there wasn't any ice but you could use that cool water and then elevating the legs just would help gravity do its job in um, in circulating all the blood and getting it to come back down into your body and circulate it around and, and repair you um, and then Uh, Di Wilson said, Claire, have you had the same blisters occur since on any other runs and races? Have you learned any new tricks for blister treatment or shoe management? Thanks for stopping to uh, thanks for stopping for a chat at the show. Oh, brilliant. Did I meet you at the show? That's fantastic. Cool. It was nice to meet you. Um, so yes, uh, blisters. Have I had the same blisters occur since? No, I have not. And that's the annoying thing. I haven't had those kind of blisters. Like ever again or like it just happens to me if I run for more than four days in a row my feet must swell and then they press together and it's that little toe that always gets the blisters it happened to me the only other time that it's happened to me is the Co Costa Rica coastal challenge and of course that's another really hot race as well and yeah so that's a that's a really really hot race and um, uh, another race where I've been going for like it was day four that I decided that this wasn't a good idea so um so yes, uh, tricks for blister management. I think for me personally, uh, take a bigger pair of shoes, definitely. That that would have just solved a trillion problems, I think. And also uh, stop, uh, even if it's even if it's like really, really early on, just, just stop and uh, take your shoes off, uh, tend to the blister, tape it all up. Don't let that blister even start. Just don't think, oh, I'm gonna miss out on everybody running, you know, I'll be last in the race. It doesn't matter. On day one of an eight day race, it doesn't matter where you come. Um, so Itoji Kawasaki says, do you ever use Vaseline as a lubricant or do you use something else? I don't actually. Um, when I was uh, younger, um, I used to use tea tree lotion quite a lot. Um, on my feet um, and that was quite good. Uh, it's like a tea tree kind of, uh, sort of a cream that you can put on. Um, but I don't tend to use Vaseline. Um, a lot of the times in the UK when you're running, you get wet feet, so that sort of lubricates them as well. Um, so I don't, but a lot of people swear by like the things like body glide and things like that, that can really help some people. I think it's um, a case of uh, uh, finding out what's best for you as well. Um, that's brilliant. Kurt Steege wants to know, have you heard what new things are at the National Running Show, what they're doing next year? Yes, the Ultra Section and the Obstacle Course Race and Dean Clownhouse is speaking. I think I covered that. That is fantastic. Oh yeah, Terry Mary's covered that for me as well. Um, <laughs> Paul Way says, the truth is out. Um, Tim Croft says, what about a 5k race? The bike show had, um, they do a cyclocross race. Yeah, well they might have a, like a yeah, 5k race, yeah, maybe I could lead a trail race, like out from the NEC, I don't know where you'd go, I'll have a look on a map, um, fantastic, um, Rosen213 wants me to suggest some beginners, two, three, and four day events, that is a great question, um, I would recommend for that, the iceberg in Sweden, it's kind of half marathon, like, 20k, kind of, distance 15 to 20k kind of distance half marathon -y distance for three days and that's in Sweden that's amazing I really like that one um uh the x energy events are kind of marathon a day for three days so so that's a bit much I think but um to pro prepare yourself for one of those three days you could always book yourself a trail race on the Sunday and you could go for a run on the Friday and the Saturday as well so that would be a good thing to do um, Guy Greatrex says he is scared to DNF so he doesn't book hard races. That's fine. Like just book, um, book like what I said to you at the show, Guy, just book in stepping stones. So book slightly harder, slightly harder, slightly harder and eventually you'll get there and you'll look back and you'll go, wow, how did I get from there to there? It's not like, it's not like people like roll out of bed and do an eight day race like 
overnight. Um, it takes years and years and years of planning and training and preparation to get there. And, and that's why I couldn't do it basically, because I tried to shortcut all of that and just go from three or four days to eight days and it doesn't work like that. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, okay. Fantastic. Oh, some more super chat from that guy on the bike. Thank you very much. A five pound donation. Best chat yet, Claire. Loved hearing about your personal experiences and mindset on these ultras. Thanks for a great chat and insight into your Cape Breath Ultra. Oh, lovely. Thank you. That is amazing. That is wonderful. Um, a running, oh, Vince Coyne says, a running show meetup and run out is a great idea, Claire. Do you know what? That's a really good idea. Next year, 2020, at the running show, maybe we should have a wild ginger running meetup. Um, yes, you could all wear, Tim Croft says, you could all wear your ginger running t-shirts. That would be really cool. Okay, I'm going to write this down and I am going to um, talk to the organisers about doing something like that because that would be really cool. A wild ginger running meetup at the show. The show. Brilliant. 2020. Yeah, maybe we could run 20 miles for 2020. No, maybe not. Just 20 minutes. Yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, before we uh, do the competition, I just need to unbox some things. So I showed you on the other live broadcast that I'm going to delete this chocolate from Carol Armitage that I found at the National Running Show. So this is the chocolate um, that I found. Um, it's chocolate designed especially for runners from Carol Armitage. And so it is, she does like a few different flavours and I was editing my um, National Running Show um, film, which you can see uh, it's like the last couple of ones on my channel. And um, I had to eat three of these in order to get that done because I was going mad <laughs> with the edit because it took me three days in the end. So this is, oh, it's delicious. This is called the Funky Monkey Bar and it's got nuts in it and banana. Is really delicious dark chocolate and these are supposed to be like I think they're like 80 calories um they're just the, the amount you can have like one of these um pretty much every day and that's okay like you're not going to get too fat um I think one square not one whole bar um I ate three of these bars um whilst doing the edit so I I did have to go on a run afterwards because I was pretty uh bouncing off the walls this is a corn flour and um and cinnamon and salt bar and this is good for recovery after running carol says and this one is the apple cr apple crumble bar so it's got bits of apple in it and it's got cinnamon star anise pecans hazelnut and ginger and that's really good to eat during the run because the ginger is really good for your stomach which leads me on to the next thing which i'm going to unbox live here on the show right now, if I can find my scissors. So this I found um, in a quiet corner of the show, almost towards the end of the show, where my brain decided to just completely stop working because I was interviewing people all day and I was trying to film it all and make a running show. But this is really cool. And I was like, wow, you should sponsor my channel. It's a company called Active Root. And this is, a box full, they've just sent me this box full of ginger hydration sachets. So if I can open this, this is a nice display box, isn't it? So this is, uh, there we go, look at all that, wow. Oops, I don't know if that's supposed to fall off, but let's have a look at this. So that is, <coughs> this is Active Root and <coughs> it's basically a gingery hydration drink um, and it's good for balancing your intestines and it's good fuel and it's good hydration as well. So I'm going somewhere tomorrow morning at 3 a.m., which I'll tell you about in a minute. And I'm going to take some of these and I'm going to try it. And I'm going to take some chocolate too because I'm definitely going to need that as well. So there's two different flavors here. Um, uh, this, oh, this one's a green tea and ginger. I'm covering up the thing. Green tea and ginger, just here. That's amazing. And this one is original ginger flavor. Oh, and there's another flavor as well. Oh, this is the one I tried at the show. This was really nice, peppermint and ginger. So this is Active Root, and I'm gonna be giving this a go, and I will be telling you how I got on with that um, very soon. And I just thought they should sponsor me, but they're only a, a little company, so um, 
They're not gonna actually sponsor me, but they just give me some free stuff. <laughs> so that is cool. Oh, Leslie Cullender says, do you have an affiliate link for the chocolate? I can never resist chocolate. And if it is for runners, then I have a valid excuse. Yes, I will put a link to the chocolate in the show notes in the description below. So <laughs> Conrad says he would eat a whole box of the chocolate. <laughs> yeah, well, you're allowed to eat one square a day, I think. <laughs> um, uh, Desmond Tinney says Active Root is awesome. Vince Coyne says Active Root stuff is great. He got some at the show. Um, Desmond also says they sponsor the 10K, his 10K and half marathon races up here in Scotland. Oh, great. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I definitely think they should sponsor me too. Um, Leslie Cullender says, are you going to do a review on the Active Root? I've heard mixed things, so it'd be interesting to see what you think. Yes, I'm definitely going to review this Active Root. Um, so I'll be letting you know how I get on with it because um, it, it sounds good. So uh, that's great. It's like two of my favorite things, ginger and chocolate all merged into one. Okay, so then I got given a couple of, um, oh yes, I got some uh, gel heel pads from CDAS as well. They look they look handy, um, especially for heel strikers, which I think I might be. Um, and then I got given a couple of little leaflets for races, so I just thought I'd give them a little plug. So this one is um, a lady called Carol and her husband Dave Murray, um, and they run mad races. Um, they do a few other races as well. This is their Swain B. Sweep trail race, um, which looks really cool in the North York Moors National Park. So definitely head along to those races if you can. They also do the Falls and Castle race on the 22nd of September, and they also do the Bolton Castle in Loughborough, um, oh no, in Leg Legborough in North Yorkshire. So um, definitely head along to Mad Moors and Dales races if you can. And their, their Facebook link is just there. It's called Mad Races on Facebook. So um, have a look at that. Um, Merlin Keating is saying, does everyone use poles in events like this? Um, so this is a seven, it says seven and 16 mile trail race. I wouldn't probably use a pole or any poles on a seven or 16 mile race. I would only start using poles for over the marathon distance and over three days of running, like the Cape Wrath Ultra. Um, uh, like on the Druids Challenge, I didn't use any poles. It was a marathon a day for three days and I think that kind of, I was out for like five, six hours every day and that was fine and I was running most of the day. It's when you know you're going to be doing a load of endurance hiking that you're going to be wanting the poles. And if there's river crossings as well, like that photo that you saw earlier of me on the Cape Breath Ultra. Okay, so um, John Simpson said, did you stop by the Run Around Europe stand? It is a great app. No, I didn't. I didn't. I shall stop there next year. Um, Guy Greatrex says, anything in Yorkshire is amazing. I definitely agree with you there, Guy. That is definitely, um, it definitely is amazing. Okay, and then I got given this, which looks really interesting, doesn't it? So this has got a seal on it like this, and it says Mission 24. And I was like, ooh, intriguing. And it says Mission 24 is a brand new event in the UK that we think would appeal to you. Um, uh, there is a code you have to have a like a crack you have to go have a go at cracking the enigmas um maybe i should just give this to one of my patrons i might give it to a top paying patron or something like that yes maybe i'll give this to somebody um because there's a vip invite here so that would be quite cool wouldn't it okay so yeah I might, I'll think about what I'm going to do with that. Um, and then I didn't get this at the show, but this is a book which I saw, which I thought was cool. It's called Jog On by Bella Mackey. Um, and it's how running saved her life. So there's been a lot lately about running and mental health in the media at the moment. So um, just thought I'd mention that this book is, is available. Um, she, she got divorced basically, this lady, and she was struggling with like some deep rooted mental health problems um, in, and she, um, she was scared of everything. She had really bad anxiety and she was in her early 20s and she couldn't even get off the sofa. She was like paralyzed with fear. And then she just started running and she just started really slowly. She used to hide in an alleyway so that no one could see her. Um, and then she used to go out at night. Um, and it, this just explains how how she sacrificed um Oh, without having to sacrifice booze, cigarettes and ice cream, she um, battled her crippling anxiety and depression. So maybe I should take this on the plane with me tomorrow because tomorrow I am 
going to Israel. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes. I'm going to Israel tomorrow because I've been asked to run the Dead Sea Marathon. Um, I'm actually running the Dead Sea Half Marathon because I've put a limit on myself this year. I'm not allowed to run more than about 13 miles. So yes, I'm going to the uh, Dead Sea Marathon, Dead Sea Half Marathon, um, which I thought was a trail race, but having watched some videos today on YouTube, I think it might be a bit roady. But I'm going to go and have a look anyway, and they're promising to take me on some trail runs on Saturday as well. So. Um, I'll be making a film of that as well, so that'll be out um, next month. Um, and I just wanted to let you know about a bonus film that's out this Friday as well. Um, it's about the Pilgrim's Challenge race. Um, so that features some really great footage from um, a guy called Chris from Here We Are Running, who um, he runs another YouTube channel called Here We Are Running. So. Um, he sent me that film and I've made a bit of a compilation around it for Friday so just let me know if you like that kind of thing and um, yeah just give me your feedback on it as well um, and now uh, it is probably time <laughs> that I launch the competition is everybody ready for this this is the first ever wild ginger running competition so every month if you're a patron, you get entered into my exclusive competition to win £450 worth of prizes, trail running kit and um, some adventures as well. So I earlier today, I uh, wrote down everyone's name. You can see on social media that I did that. And then I popped it all into this hat. And soon I'm going to need a bigger hat <laughs> because there are a lot of people in there. So are we ready for the competition? Let's just... See, yep, is everybody ready? Right, so what one lucky person in this hat is gonna win is a pair of lecky poles. You're either, you can choose between the Lecky um, Trail Pro, uh, Micro Trail Vario, which is this one, which you can vary the length of using this really simply like that, or you can choose to get a different pole. You can choose to get the Micro Trail Pro, which is very similar to this, but it doesn't have an adjustment here. So you just have to know what height that you need and the guys at Lecky can help you out with that. So the great thing about this pole is it's got this little, um, uh, sort of a little, um, sort of a glove thing here. And you just pop your hand in it like that. And then, you don't actually have to hold the pole when you don't need to. So when it's swinging, you don't have to hold it. And then to get your hand out, you simply press this button and gone. So there we go. That is called the S grip. And that's really simple to use. And that's really cool. And it's a really nice cork grip that feels really comfy. And it folds down really small as well. I will just give you a quick demo of that. So you put it, you have it up like that and you pull it all the way in and then to fold it down you press this button just here. Just be careful of your um, fingers um, when you do that because it can bite you. And then really simply folds down and you can put it in your pack like so, like so or like so. You get two in the competition and these are worth about £140. So somebody will win a pair of these. Um, they will also win the backpack of their choice. So you can see that I've been reviewing packs um, for a little while on my YouTube channel. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, and you can even win this if you want, um, especially because I'm going to be um, testing the new Salomon packs at the end of February when they send me the new Salomon Ultra packs. So uh, keep stay tuned for that as well. Um, so, um, oh, somebody wants to know about the advantages of poles. Oh, uh, the advantages of poles are they, uh, Merlin Keating wants to know the advantages of running in poles, like the Lecky pole, like this. Um, and basically, uh, <laughs> Kurt Steed is like, come on, pick me. Sorry, I just need to answer this question about poles and then we'll, then, and then tell you another thing that the person's going to win. Um, how do people run this without, do people run this without poles? 
excuse my noobness, what is the advantages of poles? So poles basically help you when you're running really long distance races or doing a vertical kilometer. So they take a lot of pressure off your knees um, and they, they make, um, uh, they just make your arms do some of the work um, and take some of the weight off your knees. And they're quite good for balance as well, like if you're crossing any rivers or if you're going through some tricky rocky sections, things like that. Um, they can uh, make you hike really fast, like Rosen 123 is just, um, 213 is just put. Um, so basically, I use them whenever I'm doing a really long race, like maybe 30 miles plus, and definitely multi-day as well. It's any races where you think you're going to have to do a lot of speed hiking, that's when I would use poles. Anything that's like um, a kind of like a half marathon or maybe even a marathon distance um, that's just like one day or a couple of days, then you'd think about not using poles. But it's, it's totally up to you. Um, and if you get a pair and you just get a light pair like these ones, you can just pop them in your pack and use them whenever you feel like you need to. Okay, so the last thing, uh, so there's a poles, there's a pack, so this pack's worth 140 quid, these are worth 140 quid, that's 280 quid. Then there is a, a place on the Glenmore Lodge um, trail running weekend. Uh, they do a couple, uh, or two or three every year, you can pick which one, um, and that is worth 130 pounds. Um, it's all about nutrition, it's all about um, trail running, it's all about uh, trying different shoes, different head torches. Um, there might be a physio there next year as well, and there's talks from elite athletes and pros. It's a really, really good weekend. So. I am going to pick the first ever winner. I'm a bit nervous actually because oh I'm just I'm just nervous. This is the first time we've ever done a competition on this channel. And this is why you're all on Patreon and this is why you're all signed up to that $5 tier or above because you can be entered into this amazing competition. So the hand is going into the hat. Who am I going to pick? Okay, I have got one. I've got one, I shut my eyes to do it. I'm gonna open it up. I spent a long time folding all these earlier. Oh, I'm nervous, who is it? It's Pascal Matheny. Well done, Pascal. So I'm gonna message Pascal on uh, Patreon. So Pascal, watch out for a message on Patreon. Um, I'll have your address on there and I'll be sending you your choice of Lecky Poles. I will be sending you the backpack of your choice as well. So get watching those backpack films um, shortly so that you can tell me which one that you require. And I will be sending you um, the details about the Glenmore Lodge uh, trail running camp as well. So that is fantastic. That's our first winner. Woo! Pascal Matheny. So well done, everybody. Um, his name will go back into the hat for next next month. Everybody's got an equal chance of winning £450 worth of trail running gear um, every single month. And there might be a few just randomly allocated prizes throughout next month as well because I've got quite a lot of backpacks and I've got quite a lot of trail running books. So it may be that eventually all of the patrons win something <laughs> from my ever growing vast gear cupboard, even if it's just one of these. <laughs> so thank you so much everybody for being such good sports and thank you for saying well, well done to Pascal as well. Um, and um, thank you very much for watching and just thank you very much for uh, putting up with the technical issues earlier as well. And um, thank you for being my patrons as well. So um, next time uh, we're going to have, hopefully, fingers crossed, I've messaged him today, Ian Keith, who came second in the spine race to Jasmine Paris. And he is going to come on and talk to us about all things uh, long distance running. And he is a person who definitely knows how to put up with pain. Um, and then also, um, I'm getting the Innovate, uh, the new Innovate mud claws with the graphene soles as well. So I'll be um, doing a gear test on that coming up as well. Um, and somebody asked about GPS watches as well. So I probably should do a bit of a chat on those as well. So yeah, so keep watching, keep pressing like, keep commenting on all the films. And um, and I'll be out on Patreon um, if you're in the $10 tier or above. Um, I'll be asking you on Monday for your questions for, for our guest, hopefully Ian Keith, on Wednesday. So keep an eye out on the Patreon page. Also just keep an eye out on the Patreon page because I'm all, always kind of putting fun stuff on there and like sneak preview things and things like that on there. Um, so there's loads of benefits apart from the competition as well. Um, 
and um, yeah, just keep an eye on the Patreon page because I've got a load of stuff in the gear cupboard and I really, really want to uh, send some more love your way, everybody. So um, thank you very much for watching. Um, yeah, thank you for the good luck about the half in Israel. I, if, I don't know if it's on roads. <laughs> um, I, I may have made a, a little error there. <laughs> but um, but um, I'll get it done and I'll make a film of it and I'll put it out um, as soon as I can. So thank you very much for watching everybody and I'm glad you enjoyed tonight's broadcast and I will see you out there on the trails. Good night everybody. Thank you.